Okay, so I feel like the audience around here has changed slightly since my last drag reality show centric video. So for those of you who are new here, I rose to extremely niche internet fame because of my commentary on RuPaul's Drag Race and other similar properties. If this isn't your thing, I implore you not to click away because the shows I'll be talking about here are just a framing device for the overall theme of redemption arcs in reality TV and in media as a whole. So even if you don't like drag, I think you'll learn a little something. For those who are unfamiliar, RuPaul's Drag Race as an international media franchise has more or less evolved faster than the speed of light. Not only do we now have the well-known US version which airs a new season every year, but there are now a number of international spin-offs based in just one country or region. And there's also a version of the show where contestants from casts around the world compete against one another in a host country. Similarly, Drag Race's popularity has paved the way for other, less mainstream drag-centric reality shows to make a name for themselves, most notably Dragula. If you don't know what Dragula is, check out these videos here. All of these spin-offs and seasons air throughout the year, and sometimes they air concurrently, which is what dictates a lot of the conversation in the fan community for these shows online. In this video, we're going to talk about two of the most recently aired seasons of a Drag Race franchise and a Dragula franchise, because they both heavily involve the theme of redemption and illustrate how to pull off a redemptive arc correctly and not so correctly. But this wouldn't be a true video essay if I didn't give some background context. A redemption arc in fictional media is pretty simple. Over the course of a book series, a television show, or even a trilogy of films, a character who is portrayed as evil, sinister, or selfish gets redeemed by a change of heart shown by either good-natured or validating actions. Some good examples of this are Prince Zuko from Avatar The Last Airbender, Darth Vader in Star Wars, I don't count the prequels, or Steve from Stranger Things. Some less than stellar attempts are Kylo Ren from Star Wars, Fucking Fight Me, Jamie Lannister, and Evan in Dear Evan Hansen. Believe it or not, this idea of a redemption arc is also true in reality TV. Drag Race has been resurrecting Queen's entire careers on all-star seasons, where contestants who may have been portrayed as villains or generally unfavorable because of their track record get a chance to compete again with a clean slate and often win over the hearts of fans. Dragula also just had their first ever attempt at this with a spin-off series called Dragula Titans, inviting contestants back to compete a second time. Now, I will be talking about these shows separately from this point on. If you want to start with Dragula Titans, keep watching. If you'd like to skip ahead to Canada vs. the World, click the timecode on the right side of the screen. If you're a fan of Dragula, you were no doubt excited for Titans, especially when you saw the cast reveal. For those who are unaware, Dragula has had four seasons and Titans is the first time that competitors who didn't win were invited back for a second chance at the crown. And I was really excited for this particular cast at first. It was a perfect mix of competitors who made it far in their season, but just fell short of winning, and earlier outs who had grown and evolved their drag and had a lot more to show to the audience. The same cannot be said for the recent trend in casting for RuPaul's Drag Race All-Star seasons, but this was definitely a good foundation for a Titan season to start off on. In All-Stars or Redemption type reality show seasons, it's not uncommon for production to throw an elevated twist to the format of the competition. In RuPaul's Drag Race, the queens in all-star seasons are given the power to eliminate queens if they win a challenge, as opposed to the judges eliminating one of the bottom two themselves. And in Dragula Titans, I, uh, um, uh, <laughs> So if you're not familiar, I go into more depth than my original Dragula video, but Dragula has in my opinion one of the most interesting and creative reality show formats of all time. Basically, there's a challenge winner and the contestants who did the worst in the challenge are put up for elimination. Instead of lip syncing like Drag Race, the bottom competitors have to go through what's called an extermination, which can be anything from getting a painful tattoo to jumping out of a plane or eating pig guts. Definitely not for the faint of heart, but really exciting and unique if you were a fan of old school shows like Fear Factor. In Dragula Titans, it's explained that the competitors all must do a fright feat, which is sort of like an extermination before the actual challenge begins. Anyone who fails to complete the fright feat will be eliminated and a previous competitor will be able to take their place. Additionally, the monsters who do not fall on the bottom will be able to vote for who they think should go home. Clearly taking a page out of Drag Race's All-Stars book a little bit, but okay. And then it just never really goes anywhere. Most of the fright feats this season are pretty dumb and relatively easy to complete, like tug of war, arm wrestling, and a lie detector test. 
The only one that was mildly scary was the drowning simulator, which they all did with no problem, so... Why introduce the game mechanic if it doesn't even come into play anywhere? Why get rid of the exterminations in favor of something that changes almost nothing about contestant progression? The other half of the format change is even more frustrating, because they only actually do it in the first episode, and then never again. Abora, who does the worst in the first challenge, is voted out by the contestants, and then she just comes back with no rhyme or reason in the following episode. This does two things. One, it undercuts any expectation that the season will be any kind of suspenseful because that first episode was actually very well received. Many people considered Abora to be a frontrunner, but not only does she return, they also just abandon the format entirely and from here on out the Boulay brothers just choose who goes home. There's no extermination to even bolster the possibility of any suspense. They lead the competitors up to a trap door and one of them falls through, which like, okay, pretty cool visual gag, I guess, but why would you just introduce this and then not do anything with it? I would guess that maybe they either realize that the monsters were making more than enough drama on their own without this idea, or that eventually one of the competitors would get smart and eliminate Victoria, who this season was more or less made for. And put your keyboard warrior bullshit away, I'm literally right. I'm not saying Victoria didn't deserve to win Titans, every look she did was phenomenal, but you can tell that there's just this big old neon sign pointing at them the whole time, and everyone else is just there for the ride. And because the format of the season is now so irrelevant and lacking in suspense, the rest of the show is just filled with, like, a lot of noise, and bickering, and arguing, which, like, that's nothing new to Dragula, sure, but also, what are you actually arguing about? None of you are putting each other up for elimination anymore. Your fate is literally sealed every episode with no extermination opportunity. There is nothing you can do to change your reality. The format just really takes the steam out of everything and makes all of the fighting so much less interesting. And look, I've defended the drama in Dragula before. I think it usually does make the show more fun to watch, but I found myself tuning out of it a little more because the stakes were so low in the actual competition. As far as placements this season, I don't know. It started to feel like Yavska, Kendra, and Erika were just there to be everyone else's punching bag and get eliminated early, so I wasn't really surprised. I don't understand why Abora is just so goddamn polarizing to everyone also. I think they're very talented, but they clearly don't follow the prompts for the challenges, and like, it's pretty cut and dry to me why they didn't win last time or this time, I don't know. And as far as the actual redemption of the cast members that the show wants us to care about, I think narratively Coco owned this season. She gave us so much drama and intensity and really elevated a lot of her looks. Her arc of starting season 4 as an early out, making herself heard in the reunion, demolishing the D&D challenge, and then coming out in the last episode as a Boulay brother. Iconic. Fucking chef's kiss. I understand why she didn't win because I think the Boulay brothers appreciate polish more than anything else, but she really was the star of the show for me. And as much as I appreciate Hoso's artistry, I just don't think she had the opportunity to grow from season 4 as much as some of the other contestants did. I think they were setting her up to be Victoria's biggest rival, but I just didn't see it. I honestly expected Eva to go farther than Hoso did, just narratively, and I thought some of her looks were better, but what can you do? I also think that Hoso low-key should have won season 4 the more than I think about it. Anyway, I think Victoria honestly didn't really need a lot of work in terms of her redemption arc. She's clearly the most visually impressive monster that has ever been on the show. Her only main critique was that she lacked personality, which I think she did a good job of showing in her Crypt Keeper look during the last episode. The biggest issue with this season is the finale, because it didn't really give anyone the redemption moment that we as audience members were objectively looking for. First of all, there wasn't a regular final floor show. Instead of three looks, the monsters only got to perform one look in a lip sync performance, which makes no sense to me. The whole point of the show is to make it to the final floor show to show off your perspective on glamour, filth, and horror. That's what everyone looks forward to, so to not include it is just a huge miss. As much as the Boulets want to claim that it's a performance-based competition as much as a look one, no it isn't. No one is coming here for the lip syncing, I'm sorry. The other issue is that the finale just seemed really rushed overall, like, after this floor show we go straight to the judges' critiques but the contestants aren't even there. And then the camera just pans up to a photo of Victoria winning. No Carrie-style crowning, no nothing. You'd think for a season like Titans they would want 
want to indulge in all of that stuff. There's been some production hints floating around in the ether that this wasn't the intended outcome for the finale and I'm inclined to believe that. I don't know if it was a production scheduling issue or a footage lost in post issue, but even if you wanted to break up the finale into two episodes, I don't know man, you had the time to do it. There are two whole ass non-eliminations in here. So even if Victoria was a deserving winner, her redemption as a titan is soured by the fact that production didn't put enough effort into her completely and fully earning her win. The audience reaction is just so inherently lackluster because we didn't get to see nearly enough of the process to get to this point. It's just really disappointing and I hope they learn from these mistakes because they really had all of the makings of a great season there and they blew it by trying to be too much like Drag Race and then backtracked. Speaking of Drag Race, let's talk about Canada vs. the World. I'll be honest and say that I think everyone is sort of overly praising this season right now because they're happy with the winner and I get it, but before you get the tomatoes, I think that this season was far from perfect, but only because Versus the World as a concept deserves a lot more care. First of all, this season is so short. It's only like six or seven episodes, there's only nine girls in the cast, and on top of it, they decided to do a top four, which at this point just makes me want to vomit. Even in a normal season, making top four is not an accomplishment to me. I don't understand what every drag show has against top threes and twos nowadays. But back to the theme of redemption. All-stars and all-stars adjacent type seasons like the Versus the World series are first and foremost meant to give a second chance to people who did not win the first time around. The situation is even more dire for international queens who as of recording this video do not have their own all-star seasons to compete on. Versus the World is really their only opportunity for additional exposure, which as we've covered in previous videos is absolutely necessary to continue making a living as a drag artist. So I really try to keep this in mind when I think about who says yes to Versus the World and why they say yes, and to be honest, I think they deserve better. First of all, like I said, the length of the season is a major issue, and because they're not back on TV for a very long time, it makes you wonder what they could have been capable of had they just been given a regular all-star season. The other main issue for me is that I really don't understand why this series has to follow all-stars rules. In some cases, like Victoria Scones, her only real experience on a Drag Race season was one where she had to vote other people off, and that just doesn't make sense to me. There was clearly no narrative payoff here because there was absolutely no drama on this season, so I don't understand the value in doing a changed format. Just like, let them lip sync for their life, man, I don't know. The voting is getting boring, and that's just not a symptom for this season, but pretty much all of them at this point. The next thing I want to talk about is Isis. Isis Couture got a lot of hate when this cast was announced because she had already won Canada's Drag Race Season 2, and from what I understand, it seemed like there may have been other winners who were cast but then dropped out, but she felt like she was pressured into coming back to the race despite her mental health not being the best. And that really sucks because I think Isis is a really talented queen, but she didn't need a redemption. There's nothing to redeem. She won. And the show just hasn't found its footing when it comes to including and highlighting winners, and I feel that way about both this season, All Stars 3, and All Stars 7, where previous winners of the main seasons were featured competitors. It's always a weird mix of production not wanting to tarnish their reputation, but also not wanting to spoon feed them another win, so it's this weird back and forth that isn't really satisfying for anyone. In fact, the only time I've ever seen a featured winner's return make sense and really pay off was Dimitri in Project Runway. So yeah, I feel really bad for Isis, I hope she's eligible for all winners eventually because I actually think she would have a really good run there if she did it. The last thing I want to talk about here is the redemption of Silky and Raja. Both contestants had previously competed together on season 11 and All Star 6. On season 11, neither of them were received favorably by the fandom due to like, the most basic of untucked drama and their overall track record and performance and of course racism and fat phobia. This was more or less rectified several years later with All Star 6, and I don't think I ever actually formally talked about All Star 6 on this channel. But I like most of it. I think Silky getting her flowers with the whole lip sync tournament was one of the best moments the show has ever had, and I think Raja is the best example of the early out to All Stars Glow Up pipeline that the show has ever had as well. Where I think All Star 6 fell short was the winner. I like Kylie, I do, but narratively the whole season felt like it was Raja's to take home, so the fact that she didn't win really didn't make her redemption arc feel complete. Fast forward to Canada vs. the world and Raja is doing well, but narratively it really feels like it should go to Silky or Victoria the way each of them really dominated the season. 
Raja is great and everyone is really happy that she won, but to me it feels like a resolution to an arc that was way overdue, rather than a reflection of Canada versus the world as a whole. So ultimately, I think this season nailed the overall theme of redemption a lot better than Dragula Titans did, but to me, less than stellar seasons are all symptoms of the same issue, which is the drag race and drag-centric reality show machine. I think taking the time and resources to produce better quality seasons with better challenges and better pacing is at this point what these competitors deserve because it's low-key starting to feel like we're getting some short, rushed bullshit to keep people subscribed to WoW Presents and Shudder, and like, I'm kinda over it. Also one more thing, Victoria Scone is incredible and she should low-key host Drag Race UK instead of Rue and Michelle, okay bye.